Michel Tremblay was born in Montreal in 1942. He studied graphic arts and became a linotypist, like his father and brother. He wrote his first play, Le Train, in 1959, and with it won the 1964 Radio Canada Young Authors Competition. But it was his second play, Les Belles Sœurs, that established him as an important writer. The first to use Joyal and feature working class women on the stage. The first of a cycle of plays set in Le Plateau Mont-Royal, district of Montreal. He went on to write a series of novels chronicling the life of the plateau. Throughout his work, he examines the difficulties and issues facing homosexuals. Over 50 years, he has produced, at minimum, 35 novels, 26 plays? No, a bit more. Three musical comedies? Yeah. Three books of short stories? Yeah. Seven film scripts? Probably. 3,000 characters, <laughs> along with a number of memoirs. His plays have been produced all around the world, and he has been awarded the title of Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres de France and the Prix David from Quebec for his body of work. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. Are you Quebec's Balzac? <laughs> For poor Balzac, <laughs> poor him. I don't know. I don't. I don't care. I don't think about uh, these uh, things. <laughs> but his his output was prodigious, and so is yours. Yeah. Well, he wrote more than I did, so <laughs> it's, it's. I don't know what to say. He chronicled life in France, social life. You chronicled social life in Quebec. Yeah, well, he, uh, he thought about um, a, a, wi a wider kind of characters and a wider kind of uh, strats of uh, society uh, than I did. So did Zola, for instance, with uh, Les rougon macquart He took the, the, the two families, the Rougon and the Macquart, uh, but in, uh, in all the stratus of, of, of society, the rich ones, one family being rich, the other one uh, being poor. Yeah. Uh, what I did is uh, is focus on the, if you want, if I can say it, on the poor people of uh, Le Petit Peuple de Montréal, like uh, well, Balzac yeah. used to say, Le Petit Peuple de Paris. So I, I focused on uh, on people who, who raised me, if I can say that that way. When I began writing in Joie, Nobody did it before, and I did it because I wanted to uh, to try to put on on the page as precisely as possible what I heard when I was young. There were writers uh, like uh, Gracien Gina and uh, Marcel Dubé who wrote in Québécois, but it was some kind of a sanitized Québécois, and I decided uh, well, it was the seventies. We were trying things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We were uh, experimenting things. So I decided to, to try to, uh, to put on the page all, almost maniacally what I heard when I was young. And that's because you wanted to document it and make sure. No, that because it was... I saw a movie uh, with my friend Andre Vassal, who became my director after. Yeah. We saw a movie in '65. Uh, a Quebecois movie which we hated, both of us, we hated that movie and we didn't know why. So after that we went to a restaurant next door and while discussing we discovered that uh, we hated the movie because it was spoken in, uh, in uh, <laughs> mid-Atlantic mid mid -Atlantic French, yeah. uh, a French that nobody ever spoke. So uh, the, the movie itself was done for nobody because uh, uh, the people here couldn't identify with the characters because the language was false and nobody in France would, would be interested in that kind of uh, bastardized so-called good French. So yeah. that's where I decided to try to uh, asking myself, is it possible to to try to, to take the real language and put it on and 
And graphically, it was new because it was complicated at first because nobody had done it. So there was no way of writing certain words because nobody wrote them before. Swears, for instance. Swear words. Yeah, for yeah. swear words. Yeah. Like Carlis, how do you say uh, tabarnak? Or it's, it's, a, it's a malformation or deformation of, of a word, but nobody ever dare use it, use it before. So how do you how write you spell it? it? How do you spell it? And so you gave it the first spelling. Yeah. Which was not the. Sometimes I was wrong because uh, Regent Cham did uh, the same thing in novels uh, at uh, at the same time, and he wrote the same words but in a different way. And sometimes I said I'm right, and sometimes I say, Oh, he's right. This yes, it, it, it should be written that way. And I changed my way of writing certain words because there were no way of uh, writing them. And I suppose you wanted to get a, a kind of an accurate pronunciation. You wanted it to sound like the pronunciation. Well, what's it, it, for instance, in my books, in my novels, uh, the descriptions are in French, and the dialogues are always in uh, in the Quebecois language because I think that and and I wanted once, if ever somebody uh, read the play uh, Les Versa I was I was writing, I wanted to. Um, <laughs> to the eye, uh, un understanding the word before the the brain, uh, it, it, and when when you write my uh, my books, for instance, it's what's interesting to me is that you you go from one kind of French to uh, another kind of French, and then the eye hears. What, what is written because it's somebody who's talking and who's talking as, as near as possible as what the, that character would say in... Uh, in real life. I, yeah, yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand, I mean, I understand, but... Uh, when a character speaks exactly the same language as the narrator, uh, it, it's, to me it's impossible because mm -hmm. nobody speaks like you describe a, a, a tree. And I never, never, never interfere in the conversations in my in my books. Uh, there were there uh, there is no uh, he said she said. Uh, when they speak, they speak, and I the narrator doesn't interfere, ever interfere. And when he's writing the the, the, the descriptions, it's him or her or what well, or it uh, who who writes. Mm -hmm. That's uh, my way of. Uh, being uh, truthful to my roots. <laughs> well, it's like listening to a real conversation. Yeah. In, in the theater it's normal, but uh, in a book it's, uh, it's rare. It's funny, you know, when I read about you and read about the, uh, the fact that you were the first to write in Joel, I thought of uh, Martin Luther and his translation of uh, the Bible into, yeah. uh, into German. Which was a, a scandal, and nobody uh, would dare do that, yeah. Well, that was a first to everything, I suppose. Like I said, it was the 70s, and it was uh, the American movies at that time were beginning to, uh, to use swear words. I, I remember the, the Robert Altman movie about hockey, I don't know, what was it, Slapshot, yes, yes. with Paul Newman, at the end of the 60s or the early 70s. For the first time we, we, we heard hockey players swear. It was a shock because we never heard that before in the movies. I think that everybody everywhere was, was trying to uh, go nearer um, reality. Yeah, and of course, Hockey players swear a lot. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> it's very interesting the fact that, you know, you've got such a gigantic output and you're so well known in the French speaking world. I bet that the vast majority of Anglo Canadians outside of Quebec couldn't even mention one or two of your novels or plays. Yeah, I know. Why is that? Well, we don't know that many English uh, writers either. Uh, we, there's uh, Thompson Highway for the theater. There's uh, Margaret Atwood, and then there, well, there are others. But yeah. uh, 
Is it just that we, we're not interested in each other? Well, my plays were produced everywhere in Canada for 50 years. My plays are quite known. But uh, my, uh, my novels uh, were translated by Sheila Fishman, a wonderful translation. In Montreal. And they yeah. were incredibly well received by uh, the critics. But uh, it's as if English Canadians are not interested. They will pay money to come see my plays, but it's as if they're not interested in, uh, in my novels, and I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe that's just generally people are less interested in novels than they are in movies and TV. Yeah, probably, yeah, but they, they read less, that's true. But still, it's quite, quite startling, the fact that you are like probably the best known Quebec writer in the world, and uh, you're not really that well known within the rest of Canada. Yeah, well, maybe it will change. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> It was the 50th anniversary of uh, Les Belles Sœurs. Yeah, last Very week, 28th of uh, August. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Old. <laughs> <laughs> Old, but uh, still kicking high, <laughs> I would say. Good. Because what's wonderful is that I'm still writing. Yeah. It could have been the, the 50th anniversary, and I could have been deep in the forest, uh, n not writing for the past 20 years or whatever. Yeah. What is wonderful is that I enjoyed all that time. I enjoyed uh, my plays and my novels being read and my plays being uh, translated all over the world. I was there all that time, and I, I kept on uh, working. Yeah. So after 50 years, to, I have a new book coming out in a few weeks. So that's, to me, it's, 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 it's wonderful because uh, there is no sour taste. I'm still there. Well, you're, so your brain is as young as ever. You're just, the rest of your body's just... I should, I should hope so. But it's not. <laughs> I'm afraid it's not. <laughs> I'm beginning to forget a few things sometimes. But it's normal. It's interesting that La Belle Sœur has been called a, a foundational document of modern Quebec. And uh, when I think of a foundational document of modern Quebec, I think of the Refuge Global from 1948. And, uh, you know, its message was uh, sort of anti-establishment, anti-religious, liberation and anarchy. Did that affect you? Oh, yeah, they affected the, oh, I was only six years old, but later I understood what, what it was uh, all about. But what's interesting is that in 1948, all the, the people, there were eight or nine who signed the refugee global, lose their... The jobs. Uh, lost their jobs. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I, I always say that if, uh, I, I think we were there, uh, my generation, at, at the right time, we were very lucky, because if... Gracien Gilina or Marcel Dubé had written Les Belles Sœurs at the end of the 40s, or the beginning of the 50s, they would have been censored. They would have lost their job, the play would have been produced. I think we were very lucky uh, when we came in 68. I wrote the play in 65, when it was first produced in 68. We were lucky to be at that time because people somehow needed or wanted to hear these things because it was it was time that they were that they were said that 15 women came on stage and and, and spoke their mind because i when i wrote les Bessins, i uh, what i thought is that the north american theater in general and quebecois theater in particular were written by a man for men and the women were always secondary characters funny secondary characters and when they were heroines, like in Tennessee Williams, for instance, it mm. was obvious that it was him. It was obvious that these women were a part of him explaining himself yes. inside a woman character. I'm and I think that with Le so it was the first time that there were 15 women on stage, but you didn't know, you, you couldn't know who wrote it. You couldn't feel the, the writer the playwright was not on stage at all. It could have been written by anybody. 
So that it, it was very important for me that they were they would speak for themselves. It was not my vision of them. It was their, as far as I as I could imagine, yeah. uh, it was their own uh, their own vision. That really sounds to me like an important theme throughout all your work. Then is just letting the characters yeah. speak for themselves. Yeah, that's uh, the, when I go to universities or uh, schools. Uh, I always say that uh, the most important thing when you write is uh, uh, to incarnate yourself inside your character, to forget yourself. Mm. Whatever you think, whatever you, your your ideas are, when you write, you have to uh, to write from the from the inside the character to the outside, not not looking at the character and judging him or her. You have to be them. That's the most uh, difficult and most probably war rewarding uh, way of my work. I love doing that, becoming, <laughs> I'm not an actor, I, I would be a very bad actor, but becoming somebody else and trying to understand how they function, how they work, what they really think is very, very uh, exciting. <laughs> it's very interesting. What I, uh, what I love is when I write a, a two, uh, well, like Hosanna, a two play character or two play a two uh, character conversation is uh, becoming one and after the other and discussing and thinking two things at the same time because they have to go on top of the other and yeah. if you read the the scenes between Mary, Mary Louise and Leopold in Forever Years, Mary Lou, for instance, or the two conversations be between uh, Carmen and uh, Maurice in Saint Carmen of the Maine, or Hosanna, or, or some in Le Vraiment, there are good things like that. A character, you say, you listen to a character, you say, oh, he's right, and then you listen to what the other has to say and say, ah, oh, he's right. So you don't, at the end, you don't know who's right, but you saw and you heard a good discussion. A good discussion is not a heroine and a, a black character on the other side, a, a good discussion. I always say that I, good, I, I, I give, <coughs> pardon, I give good reasons to my bad characters to be bad, and I give wrong reasons to my Heroes to be heroes. It's more. It's more human. Well, it's not black and white, mm -hmm. and there's, uh, you have to think about it. They could. They can't be all. Uh, it can't be uh, in, in, on one side all right and on the other side all wrong. It's, that's yeah. impossible. I think Tolstoy once said something like that. He said, uh, in a good, a really good novel, it's not good versus bad. It's good versus good. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they're they're well, they're right in their own uh, in their own body in their own thinking. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't like to be inside uh, Donald Trump's uh, these days, but uh, he's probably <laughs> think he's right. <laughs> I assume he thinks he's right. I assume he thinks he's doing the right thing. Who knows? In the play, Germain Lauzon wins one million customer loyalty stamps, and then, as you say. The, the other women uh, help her stick these uh, stamps into books so that she can claim them. You, you portray these women as working class and they give in to envy and greed, climbing the ladder and belittling others. Mm -hmm. well, the, what's interesting in Libessa is that once Germaine Lauzon wins the million trading stamps, she changes sides, she becomes a small boss, she becomes a leader, and in the play she doesn't paste one single stamp. She's the supervisor and she, she's telling everybody else, uh, we're not here only to talk, we're here to paste stamps, so sit down and paste. They're that, doing her a favor. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. and that's why uh, they go against her, because uh, She's so proud and she's so nasty about uh, the one who, who's going to have all these wonderful th th things uh, gratis yeah. uh, uh, with her books that uh, they all go against, uh, against her and they steal uh, the more stamps they can because uh, she's not a nice lady. Yeah. Once, uh, once she's won, she changes. 
So why do you think it's been called a founda foundational document of modern Quebec? Well, you should have the people who said that. <laughs> I really don't know. Okay. Probably because of the language and probably because of uh, the social meaning of these 15 women. It was the first time that you, you saw only women and 15 on the, on on the them, stage yeah. on a stage speaking their mind. Women n almost never spoke their mind on, on a stage. They were well dressed and nice and cute and funny. So you're literally giving them a platform. Yeah, yeah. Without really realizing it, it, it would be uh, easy fifty-three years later to invent myself intentions. I didn't have any intentions. Yeah. I I had needs, which is very very different from having intentions. I didn't want to write a feminist play. I wanted to describe these women as they were. And and what? what like, why did you have that need? I don't know. Uh, the, you know that 24 hours before uh, beginning writing Le Belsa, I didn't have that need. I didn't know I had that need. I was uh, writing fantastic novels, fantastic tales. My first book that was uh, published in 66 is 41 uh, fantastic short uh, stories. And I was, uh, I was going on the side of Edgar Allan Poe and Jean Ré and uh, and when I saw that movie, it was my epiphany. What was the name of that movie again? Uh, Cain, in French, Cain. Cain. Yeah, like C A I N, like uh, Cain and Abel. And uh, it's Quebec uh, produced. Yeah, it, it Quebec uh, from '65. And uh, yeah, well, I didn't. And when I began writing, writing it, I discovered that it was my past. That it was this is what was waiting for me. Uh, I, I didn't know I had that need and once the characters were on the paper and I began writing the play, the passion and the love I had for these women who, who raised me. And who That's were, right, you were raised by a, a lot of women. Yeah, well I was born in 42 so there were not that many men in Montreal, they were all uh, in, uh, in World War II. So uh, there was uh, my my father didn't go to uh, to war because he was deaf. So it, it was the only male, and we were three families living together in the same uh, apartment to eat well. Uh, and it was a very good idea. It was we were all uh, uh, related, but we were twelve people in a seven seven uh, room apartment, uh, and uh, there was one man there. Uh, well, my two brothers and me, but I mean a, a grown-up man. Yeah, it was only my uh, my father. So I was raised. Yes, I was raised by women. So the first critics, uh, the first things I heard about society, uh, came from women, from the side of, of of women. So probably, when I was very young, I uh, some kind of uh, took their side without knowing it because they, they, it was the first criticism and, and I think that in, in many ways they were right and they didn't have the, the right to vote, they didn't have any rights but uh, what they were saying was to me was very sensible and uh, that's why I put everything I could in uh, what's interesting in Le Bessa now 53 years ago it's, it's youthful it's uh, it's too much. There are too many characters. There are too many actions. There are too. There is too much of everything. But it's very juvenile. It's very lively because it's obvious that it's it's written by a, a very young human being trying to put everything he can in uh, in the play. So I, my plays after that are more controlled, if you want. That play is not controlled by, uh, at all. It goes everywhere. It, and yet it's one of your biggest successes. Yeah. Because of its youthful, I think. I, I wonder, do you think your homosexuality, do you think the fact that you were raised by women has anything to do with it? Or no. do you think you were born with it? No, no, I was born with it. Okay. There are no, no discussion about that. Hosanna. You were reflecting on the identity of Quebec. Yeah, I was looking for... Um, well, we, the, 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 it was 71, so we were 
beginning to want to be a country and to uh, you know all all about that. Yeah. And I was uh, I was looking for a subject about uh, uh, the the Indian uh, identity crisis. Who am I? Uh, where am I going? Uh, what am I? Uh, am I a Canadian? Am I a, a, a Quebecois? Uh, anyway, so. And in uh, a musical I wrote a year before called Demain Matin, Montréal Matin, there was a character <laughs> uh, called Rosanna. And François Barbeau, who was the greatest uh, costume designer we ever had, in, probably in Canada, he was really a genius, dressed my Rosanna as Cleopatra. And a year later, when I was looking for a subject to talk about the identity crisis... So I, was it your identity crisis or was it Quebec's identity crisis? Quebec's identity okay. crisis, not mine. I never had one. Okay. <laughs> You're lucky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I thought about that uh, man dressed as uh, a transvestite, as dre uh, dressed as the Cleopatra, and I tried to dig and I found a hairdresser, a man, a hairdresser, who always uh, dreamed about being a woman, who always dreamed about being an English actress, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, raised in the United States, dressed as an Egyptian myth in a movie that was shot in Spain and uh, North Africa. So I said, oh, that's a wonderful identity problem. <laughs> so I decided to write a, a, some, somehow a, a, I have problems talking about that because I was so many times uh, wrong quoted about that. You were quoted, misquoted? Mispo, merci. I was misquoted about that. I never, 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 ever said that in the play Cuiret is Canada and Hosanna is Quebec. I never, ever, ever said that. It comes from a, a New York Times interview when Hosanna played uh, on Broadway and uh, the journalist uh, wrote that, it made me say that and since then, it was in 76, 7, and since that it glued to me and I never ever said it. What I wanted to to do uh, with Hosanna is a double striptease. She comes in dressed as uh, Elizabeth Taylor in Cleopatra. She undresses through the play and she undresses her mind, her soul in front of us all over the play asking this question, who am I, what am I? Does a man have to uh, to wear a pants and does a woman have to wear a, a dress and who's the man and who's the man in our couple and are you the man or am I the man and, and all that. So that's, uh, it became much more a, a, a question about couple, a question about relations uh, than uh, only about a, a, a psychological uh, striptease and I think that now, almost 50 years later, it's quite obvious, it's, it's, it's a play that me, me, the meaning didn't change, but it shifted. And now that we're used to see transvestites anyway, and uh, there's nothing to, to shock anybody in that play uh, anymore, uh, we can focus on the, the big discussion about who's the woman, who's the man in the first act. It has become very different and very uh, interesting because uh, we have been asking these questions uh, since then. And uh, it's very interesting that the play was written 47 years ago. Well, it, it is interesting because that, that, whole, that whole debate has, uh, has kind of shifted. Just in the, first of all, sort of setting this, the stage, the set, you want there to be an atmosphere of sadness and solitude. Also, Hosanna's perfume stinks. And it's funny when you when you uh, when you focus on that. I, I I've smelled the worst perfume in Spain, so I don't know. <laughs> I automatically think of being on the subway in Spain. What what I hate more are the very sweet American perfume. I live in in, in Key West six months a year, and sometimes it, 
Yes, it's so sweet. It doesn't smell like flowers, or it, it's only like like chocolate. Or I don't know. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> so yeah, we get the we get the idea. Of this is kind of a cheap. Uh, you, this isn't a nice picture of of this person, of uh, of Hosanna. You get the impression of a bundle of rags that is somehow standing up, and then finally here she should not appear funny, quote unquote. She is a cheap transvestite, touching and sad, exasperating in her self-exaltation. Now, I, I, this is where this accusation of, of this play being transphobic comes in. You're saying, I guess, that she's un, he is unhappy. Yeah, but uh, th that description is uh, uh, everybody knows that I'm, there are very uh, uh, wonderful and very slick transvestites, but we forget that there are poor people, poor young guys who put anything on them that look a bit like a woman and they think that they look like a woman and this is it, it's a fact. It's we shouldn't get away from that and say that it doesn't, and, and say that it's transphobic. It's not transphobic. It's the reality. At that time, just before that, I saw a Swiss documentary about a, a, a transvestite, but a, a guy in, in in Geneva, who who used to dress uh, to dress as a secretary. It it was not flamboyant at all. Yeah. He, he was a very plain man, not not beautiful, not and the the clothes he wore in in which he was happy and uh, à l'aise uh, were uh, uh, being dressed uh, as a secretary. And yeah. I remember uh, very vividly a, a picture. The last picture was him sitting in a Geneva uh, park, dressed as these little mouse of a, of a lady, and being happy. And th that that image, that picture, stayed in me. For and I think that for Rosanna, for Rosanna is, is flamboyant, yeah. but not flamboyant in a in a chic way. Is flamboyant. Because in in a way that he's not he's a poor he, he's he's a hairdresser he doesn't have any money so what he can put on him is not beautiful and to me it is beautiful do it do it even if you don't have the means to do it properly but do it because you need it okay the the yeah. accusation of of transphobia though is that I guess it's your they think that what you're doing is painting. A stereotype of yeah. of a homosexual. Well, but it was written forty-seven years ago. What other play can you find forty-seven years ago talking about that? If I wrote Osana today, maybe, maybe. But forty-seven years ago, I'm very sorry. But shut up. <laughs> <laughs> shut up and be beautiful if you want. One of the things that I got out of the play. Is at the ending, which was very powerful, was that, man, that, uh, that homosexuals who don't know if they're men or women, uh, it, it, would, it would be awful yeah. if you don't know, because it's the strongest drive that you have, your sex drive, and if you don't know if you're a man or a woman, you must be fucked up. Yeah, there, there's a new uh, breed I don't know you call them in English, but in French they call themselves non-genre. They don't have any genre. What is? They're not men. They're not women. They're not. There's some something, something in between. Yeah. But uh, it, it's okay. I don't. I really don't mind. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to sexuality, as you just said, you have to be one side or both sides. But if, even if you're bisexual. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have a genre. You 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 can't be non genre. You can't be nothing. I don't know what this this idea of uh, claiming that you're nobody. Don't have any genre. It's uh, if you want to become a woman or a woman who wants to be man, it's okay. I have no problem with that. But can you be in between? I don't. Maybe yes. Maybe I'm wrong. But can you be just in between, not mm -hmm. knowing? Yeah. You have to know who you are not not saying that uh, you don't know. 
Well, because yeah, you've got some kind of sex drive, yeah. and it, you need to to everybody does ful fulfill it somehow. You can have both. It's okay. I don't mind about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. in fact, in the in uh, Hosanna, there's an there's an interesting part where both uh, Curette and Hosanna are kind of accusing each other of being women. Well, Hosanna, wait, uh, Hosanna uh, calls wait, uh, Curette uh, uh, a maid because yeah. he does all the cooking. But that's women. that's according to society. That's the, the, this is what is important. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're the man because you stay home and I go and I earn money. Right. According to society, you're a woman. And the, the other one says, no, you're a woman because you wear a dress and I'm a man because I wear pants. Yeah. This is very, very important in, uh, in the play. It was mm -hmm. 1971 once again. Mm -hmm. And we were beginning uh, asking ourselves questions about those, uh, about those things. One of my little theories here is that uh, just just to, to talk uh, quickly about about the play itself, that uh, it's set in the Plaza Saint Hubert apartment of uh, Claude Lemieux, who's a farm boy who has reinvented himself as a trans trans diva, Hosanna, who's based on Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra, and the aging uh, leather biker stud who affects uh, machismo. And sort of against his his feminine side, and they're both transvestites because they're both disguised. They're both. Yeah, that is not a real tough man. So he's this. He's, he's a transvestite. He's dressed yeah. as something he's not. They're both in drag and all. Yeah, way. and it seems like what Hosanna wants is is adulation and uh, dreams about a grand entrance to a it's a Halloween party that. Mm -hmm. Uh, curette and some other friends have put on, but it's a, basically it's a bit a bit of a trap. It's a bit of a joke because Hosanna expects to have this wonderful entrance. Yeah, he's been dreaming about it for years. And yeah, so, and then they crush uh, without saying how. Uh, the uh, the crush is uh, his dream, and that makes him do this uh, double striptease. And I think the key is that he's humiliated. For me, anyway, the most important takeaway from the play is respect. Yeah. Neither of these characters respect themselves, it doesn't seem, and they don't respect each other. And in, in Quebec and in Canada, I don't think Quebec felt like they were being respected by the rest of Canada, still, and that's why they still, wanted to leave. Still now, <laughs> no, still it's this. We, don't, we never felt liked and we never were. So uh, why is that? Like, why do you feel that you're not getting respect? I, contempt. I don't know. I, just, I, I really don't. We were sold to the English two hundred and twenty-five years, fifty years ago. You were sold? Yeah, we were. By the Catholic religion, who said to uh, to English people, if you don't destroy us, we'll we'll manage to keep them calm, will manage to, uh, they, so they man, the, the religion manu, manipulated us in being sheep. In a way, it's normal that we were uh, uh, being, uh, not contempted, what's the word, being, uh, that other people felt contempt for us, because we didn't fight enough. But we were so few. It's very, you, you, there, there's something that's very important in Quebec. It's called La Revanche des Berceaux, which means the revenge of uh, what you put a, a child into uh, to rock, to rock him. A cradle. A cradle. Uh, the, it's called the revenge of the cradle. And in no way it saved us, and in another way it was horrible. It saved us because we decided to make babies to survive. So women were uh, pregnant 25 times in their lives. It did save us, but it was horrible to ask a woman to, uh, to bear 25 uh, children in her life. In a way, we were saved by an incredibly human and unhuman, inhuman and cruel 
uh, thing asking women to be who wants to be who wants to have 25 children yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 like horrible. A baby but it did save us we're here because of that but we're here because of a horrible thing so exploitation no 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 yeah no no don't have to ask yourself why we're fucked up <laughs> in no way so the church colluded with the english yeah the the english ruling class yeah. And leave, leave them to us. Which means what? Which means we'll manipulate it, them into obeying you and obeying us. All of that to stay French, which uh, once again is a wonderful and a horrible thing. They, they, they did that because they wanted Quebec to stay French. But they did it in a very cruel way again. So you didn't want to be assimilated no. like, like the uh, native indigenous population. So the church saved you, but the, in so doing they exploited they women. They fucked us, yeah. The for church fucked you over. Yeah. And they got to stay in power, that's the, the thing for them. Yeah, they stayed in power till the 60s. Yeah. There's a scene in uh, Les Bessards that uh, is a riot today is uh, when they listen to, uh, what is the chapelet, what is the, the, the thing you, uh, a rosary. Oh, when, yeah. when they recite the rosary, all of them kneel and listen to uh, the voice of a Cardinal Léger at the radio. Uh, the family rosary for tens and tens of years was uh, the most uh, listened to a radio show <laughs> at seven every night, all the Quebecers. Uh, went on their knees and opened the radio and recited. It's horrible, but we were kept. That's why the the, the Revolution Tranquille was so important. That's why it, it came so quickly. It exploded so quickly because a generation, one generation said, enough is enough. They're trying so obviously to... it was a revolt against the church primarily or a revolt against the church and then the British? Uh, you mean the uh, Revolution Tranquille? Yeah. Against society. <laughs> against, against everything. Everything. Yeah, yeah well, that's, uh, that's, that's what the yeah. Refuge Global if, is. Yeah, if you, re if, if you read uh, uh, Le Refuge Global, it's exactly what they said uh, uh, back then. Uh, to, uh, almost 20 years before we, d we did it, but they were not strong enough, powerful enough yeah. to, uh, to make that, that Revolution Tranquille that we made uh, 15 years later. Because at so their time, people were not ready to hear what they had to say. When we came in, they were. That's okay. the big difference. Okay. It's not a question of quality of theater, of quality of novels, or whatever. It's, it, it's a question of what the, the Quebec people needed to hear at long last. So what would have happened if there was no church? What do you mean? Where there's no choice, where, when? In Quebec. At the, at the time. At the, at, you said that there was a collusion between when? the English and the church to keep the yeah. French population down and docile. And So what happens if there wasn't a French church? What would have happened? You, but the, what, the, what's interesting is that at that time already, church and power were together, so it, it's it's unthinkable that the church was not there because... Uh, I'm thinking hypothetically though. Well, I don't know. I, I really don't know because the, <laughs> the Quebec was founded by religion, was founded by, the, by priests coming from very sincere priests. What was horrible is that a religion was an excuse to, uh, to steal the, the, the riches from, uh, from the Indian, from mm -hmm. the... the mm -hmm. and, oh. and, but they sent uh, priests saying that they, 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 they were going there to, uh, to make Catholics out of, of Indians, which was not the real reason. It was, it, it's, all, it's like the, when I was young, the, 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 the priest in China, I used to buy little Chinese every week. For five cents, I could buy a, chi a little child, a little Chinese child. What's no, I'm not sure. In, what you're in talking Quebec, about. when I was young, in Quebec at school, yeah. every week you gave five cents, and you could buy a little Chinese child. That's what they said. Who's they? The the, the Catholic religion. They said you could buy one. Yeah, to make money. 
all the children. What they do, give them your na their when, name? When, when we say that we come from far, we do come from far. We, we come from, from very deep in ignorance. It's, it is absolutely true that we were kept in, in ignorance for a very, very long time. And that explains why, like I said earlier, the, the Revolution Tranquille was so uh, <laughs> immediate, was so quick. You know that we were the, one of, of the only people in the world who, who, who got rid, rid of the Catholic religion without shedding one single drop of blood. Because just because we were sick of it, and one generation you, said it's enough. So how one. did you do that? We just forgot about it. You didn't we attend stopped, church. We stopped, you stopped attending church. Yeah, we stopped uh, getting, uh, getting, getting to church, and we began talking about it. And for the first time, we uh, we were not censored. You're just getting back to Hosanna. When you say Hosanna, it's like a special kind of respect for the Savior, who's Jesus coming into Jerusalem, Hosanna. <laughs> yeah. that, that, Why did you pick Hosanna? I, I don't remember, because I told you it came from a, a musical comedy, and it, uh, okay. and it, it, it was a funny name, okay. a transvestite called Hosanna. Yeah. Was, <laughs> okay. I don't want to leave respect here, because you still don't think that the rest of Canada respects Quebec, or yeah. <laughs> okay. So what? I think I think that the rest of Canada likes some of us, but they never did like us. Okay. <laughs> so what are they supposed to do to show respect? Let us go away. Let let Quebec have independence yeah. if they want. Yeah. We would, we would be less of a trouble. We are a trouble uh, because, of, uh, because we're different, that's okay. Yeah. Because of the language, it's another language. Because 90% of us are in the same, in the same province. That, that's the way I explained. Uh, when my plays began to be produced in the United States, I was not only the, the first playwright, but the first Quebec French Canadian, they, they they learned about because most of Americans even now don't know that uh, that we exist, that there are French talking people, and uh, that's the way uh, I explain them. Uh, if all the black people of America of the United States lived in California, they would have a Quebec problem, don't you think? <laughs> Think about it. The problem is, though, these days, uh, and in fact, Bernard Landry made that point, is that immigrants are diluting purely. Yeah, it's not. It's it's not the same world. Uh, the world has changed, so uh, it's more complicated. It, if we had done it in 1980, uh, we would be a country receiving. Uh, people from all over the world, and it would be okay. Right. But we didn't do it, so that's why everybody has a problem uh, 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 about that. It has a problem about a very normal thing, because we have to receive these people. They, they, they don't have a country, or they want to leave because they're in danger, or whatever their reasons are. But if we were a country, they would know it's a French country, and they would choose us because we're French. Yeah. They would not choose Canada through Quebec to go to the United States after. So, separatism is a lost cause, it's not going to happen? Yeah, we don't. I, I, I don't want to say, I, you, you will never make me say that, <laughs> because you, uh, you, don't, you, you don't abandon your dreams. Yeah. You should never do no. it. No. It's, I, I still, I, I'm old, I'm 76, I feel like uh, a dinosaur when I, when I, dinosaur when I talk about that. But uh, here it is, it's my youth dream. We didn't do it, and I don't want to just put a cross on it and say, like, you know that uh, 
After uh, 1980, some people were for separatism or whatever, independence, uh, changed side and began. It was a, a horrible time because some very eminent pe people uh, began laughing about their own, their own dream. They, they changed sides or not, they didn't change sides, but they, they began laughing because we didn't do it and say that it was it's stupid, it was stupid, it was... Uh, yeah, it's it idealistic. Was, it was so sad. Okay, I'm going to hit you with a few names quickly. Okay. And then I'd, I'd like to uh, just sort of finish off with... Uh, uh, I want to continue going through the play itself, uh, Hosanna, which... Uh, Incidentally, I saw again at the Centaur Theatre earlier in 2018, co-starring Eloi Archambaudouin oui. and David Chazis, uh, and it was directed by Mike Payette. Were you happy with that production? Yeah, I was very, very happy. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was not uh, flamboyant, it was not chic. It was, I saw some productions in the United States who were uh, very slick, and I, I liked the, the trash way of that production. It was very trash. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do you think of René Levesque? Oh, well, he was a god. He, he, has his, he had his uh, default. But uh, he was, you know that René Lévesque came from TV. When I was young, he used to explain, he, he was the first man who explained us who, who we were and what we could and should do. That's why he was so popular after that. <laughs> I don't want to, like Trump, Trump from, from, come, comes from TV, but he's the black one and René Lévesque was the white one. What about Pierre Trudeau? A horrible man. He snubbed me all uh, all his time. <laughs> whenever That's why he didn't whenever like him. we, we crossed uh, each other, he looked away. He never looked at me in the eye. <laughs> That's not why I hate him, but I mean that. Uh, he really was a son of a bitch. Just because of his beliefs? Or because the, no, the way, the, the way he was. He was uh, everything I hate in him. Uh, in a man, that snub way, and the fact that he had an accent in both languages. <laughs> he was speaking French with an English accent, and English with a French accent. It was... Uh, the, the way he was, the way he... he I, I, I didn't like. My point. <laughs> okay. You think he was phony? Mm, I think the word was invented for him. He had, did he have the best interests of Canada in his heart? Yeah, but not Quebec. Yeah. What about Lucien Bouchard? But, and, and the problem I have with Lucien Bouchard is that he changed side at one point. He was quite wonderful when he was uh, on our side. <laughs> Hugely charismatic. But yeah, he is one, a wonderful man, but he came from... Uh, from the other side. There are, there are ma many, many uh, politicians who change, uh, and I don't understand that. I, I, are they in politics uh, because of what it will gi gi give them, mm -hmm. or are they in politics for us? And that's what they say, but uh, can you believe them? So it's a typical politician. Then. Yeah, I hate politicians. Yeah, I do. They, they, they lie to us, we know they lie to us, they know we know they lie to us, and they go on lying. Yeah. <laughs> I can't stand, I haven't interviewed very many politicians, I can't stand it when I interview a politician. <laughs> At least with the authors, they're, I guess, you know, they're lying to get to the truth. <laughs> they're, uh, you know, I, at least that's my sense. You know what uh, Jean Cocteau used to call that? Mentir vrai. Right, that's good. Lie truth. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. What about Mordecai Richler? Mordecai Richler uh, loved Quebec but hated everybody who was living in it. <laughs> Did he hate you? No, no, no. 
Nobody, oh, I shouldn't say that, no, okay, no, he didn't hate me, I don't think so. You, you knew him? We met a few times, we did a reading together in New York at one point, and it was a wonderful day. Good. Yeah, I admire And his. we were both uh, invited on her at the, the, the Salon du Livre in Montreal uh, a few years before he died. Okay. Uh, Let's, uh, I'd like to just sort of get back to the play. Go shit yourself, Sandra. Go shit yourself, you dried up cunt. Well, That's 1971, so you, you yeah, exactly. just allowed to do, the, they didn't censor that. No, no, no. Rosanna, does, you know, she, she kind of attacks a lot of people. She's very sort of aggressive. Well, she's frustrated, so yeah. it's normal. After what she, uh, she just lived, it's, it's normal that she's on the defensive. Yeah, they, the, the two characters, toward the end, you know, you, you know that they love each other, but man, they don't hold back. They, mm. They're attacking each other throughout well, the whole play. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> that came out in 63. Yeah. And uh, of course, that's the, the reason I checked out before coming here, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, is because of Liz Taylor. Yeah, in, yeah. In it. Exactly, yeah. Did you think... But the movie, the movie came later. Uh, because it was a Utah Hagen who uh, who did it on Broadway in '63. Okay, but was did the movie come out before Hosanna? You wrote Hosanna. I don't think so. Movie. But what was important to Hosanna, in a way, was the great entrance of uh, Cleopatra in Cleopatra. Movies are pivotal in your career, it seems. They're what? Pivotal. They're really important. Yeah. Watching Kane changed your life. Yeah, yeah. So do you... Uh, the, the most important movie of my life is Eight and a Half, Fellini. Why is that? Uh, because he was the first on in a movie to, uh, to mix reality and uh, fiction and uh, assembling all the characters of the life of a man in the same movie. We could see that in, uh, on a stage, but in a movie. At the end, you remember, when all the characters of his life uh, comes down the big stairs and uh, he's, he's just as a little uh, a piping man, a piping boy. Every time I saw that, I, when I want to cry, I watch that, that scene. I put the DVD, I want to hear, and then I, I cry, oh my God, my God's up because it's so wonderful assembling all the characters of a man's life in a grand staircase and having him in front of them. So what's uh, the story about the, the man with the pipe and uh, the yes, rats? Pied Piper of Hamlet. Pied Piper of Hamlet. Uh, they, they all follow him like little rats in the, in the story. Well, so, yeah. So nice. It's, it, but it's a very, very sad because... What? He, yeah. he basically takes yeah. all the children out yeah. of the village and yeah. because he was screwed over by the town's leaders, I think. Yeah. Why did you... Uh, yeah, here we are, another one. Jesus Christ, Jesus, Jesus, motherfucking Christ. That's English. It was probably very different in French. What would it be in French? I don't remember the, the, the exact uh, quotation. But this is. Oh, it's like shit yourself in French is va donc chier. It's, it, it doesn't, it's not exactly the same thing. Traditore, traditore, we all know that. Va uh, chier is just go shit. It's not shit yourself. Shit yourself is more powerful. It's an example, though, of yeah. bringing Joël yeah. yeah. swear yeah. words onto the stage. Yeah? Yeah. But not, she didn't do it just to be shocking. You did it to. Oh no, I never, ever, ever, ever in my life wrote one single word to shock. Mm -hmm. I think that when, uh, when Les Basseurs first came out, I had to go to TV and, and, and radio and hundreds of times. I, I think that people knew me before they knew the play, they didn't know what I was talking about. And I always said that I never placed a swearing word 
that was not necessary. And it's, I can say it's absolutely true. I never put a swearing word to shock anybody. Well, it's very powerful, it's forceful, and you want to yeah. emphasize. Yeah, toward the end of the play, Hosanna says, I'm not a woman. You're going to have to get used to that. What it refers to the fact that in the first act, he, he says to, uh, he asks Cuirette, uh, who are you sleeping with? Are you sleeping with a woman? And, and, and if you're sleeping uh, with a woman, if you like women, you should go to a, a real woman. Are you afraid of, of, of women? And, or are you sleeping with a man? If you're sleeping with a man, why are you sleeping with a man dressed as a woman? So it, it's a reference of that. It's, I'm just, from now on, I'm, now on, I'm, uh, I'm a man and you have to get used to that. And it's very interesting, when we first did it, André Brassard, the director, who was a genius, said very, 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 uh, something very important to the two actors and, and to me. He said, what about the day after? Does and after that it changed all the, the, not what we were thinking about the play, but it's true, will he, he be, will he have the courage to go on being a man, or will he go to, uh, to his hairdresser place, uh, not being exactly a man, will he, will, he, will he have the courage to assume what he said? We yeah. don't know that. And that's interesting because we should never, never, a play should never, never, never give answer to, answers to anything. Well, Curette says the important thing is that you be yourself, which again, with transvestites and transsexual, uh, transgender, that's the whole point. You don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. So the important thing is that you be yourself. How do you be yourself if you don't know what you are? Well, but that after what? After it's the end of the play. After everything uh, Hosanna uh, went through, uh, Huirette uh, hopes that he, he now knows who yes. he is. And it's uh, if you if you watch the play, if you read the play, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that uh, Hosanna never says to Cuire that he loves him, and Cuire says to Hosanna twice that he loves him. At the end of Act First, you know you know what I love you, and he goes away. Yes. And in, in the second act, he says it's not Hosanna I love, it's Claude, which can't be really possible because it's. It's new. Being clothed is, is, is new, but it's a way uh, of him to be nice for me. Yeah, I found it moving and yeah. uh, I touching. hope it is. Touching. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I hope it is. It's interesting about Liz Taylor. She was a big she was a philanthropist. But uh, not at that time. Not at that time, but yeah. later on she yeah. became a gay yeah. icon yeah. because of her... Uh, she was already a gay... A, a gay uh, uh, icon because of her beauty and because of the way she dressed and, uh, and all that. Yeah. But she became a serious one uh, when AIDS came in the, in the 80s. She raised money yeah. to uh, find a Millions, cure for it. Millions. Uh, she yeah. was quite wonderful. About yeah. That. Did you ever meet her? No. no. No, she never came to Montreal, I don't know. Do you think uh, we've covered your... what obsesses you? Is there... have you gotten to that? What? Why you write? Are you obsessed? Oh. <laughs> Are you obsessed by anything? I think that any teenager, boy or girl, who begins uh, writing at 14 or 15 is because of their problems, it's obvious. When you have problems and you cannot uh, share that with uh, your entourage, what do you do? You don't have this expression in English, and it's quite a wonderful expression in French, is se confier à la page blanche to confide to a, the white page. Right. We say that in French. So a 14-year-old girl or boy who has problems, what do they do? They confide to the, they write. It comes, it has to come, so, so writing has to come from a need. You need to write because you need to express something. And if you like it, you go on writing, I suppose, I don't know. No, it's more than that, because when I was young, I was dreaming about be, becoming a, 
a writer before understanding what it what it is because I I love reading. I, wa yes. I wanted to be that person who was uh, who was responsible for that. I love that your you and your mother talked about yeah. books. Yeah. You read the same books, and then you she got made me read uh, some books. I tried to make her read Jules Verne, but she hated every every page of it. But once she read something. Uh, that was moving her, she, uh, she made me read it, or oh, she asked me to, to read it, and so that's how I discovered uh, Gabriel Leroy. She made me read uh, The Tin Flute when I was 14, and it was one of the most uh, wonderful uh, week of my life. I think you're very lucky to have a mother like Oh, that. yes, I am. I wrote... Uh, a lot she, of she's the, 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 the pivot, she's the, the, the center of everything I wrote. How's that? Well, everybody has a mentor. Everybody has somebody. Sometimes it's uh, it's it's a professor. It's, it's a teacher. Sometimes it's a friend. Yeah. And uh, the the person that made me is my mother because she was old when I she was forty or forty one when I was born. So when I came to be ten and fifteen, she was already past fifty. So uh, the. The relations I have with her was more like a grandmother to a, to a, a grandson than a mother. Uh, so we never had this fight, uh, this serious fight, mother or child. The fight we had were about books. <laughs> Which is fantastic, <laughs> yes, really. It is. Yeah. No, I have to say, you're very lucky to have that, I think. And it's like you had a little book club right in your family, you know, right yeah, there. Well, yeah, my, well, everybody except my aunt uh, was reading at home. I so was very it. lucky uh, for that. You wrote a book about my life as a bookworm or yeah. something like that. What, what was the that? The birth of a bookworm. The birth of a bookworm. I, I wrote four books about what books, movies, and plays. Uh, uh, the last one, I uh, know, uh, um, subject, uh, uh, that were in the, uh, important in my childhood and in my youth, explaining how... Uh, Movies came to me, and books came to me, and plays came to me, mm -hmm. and I loved re uh, writing that books. And these are all in translation, published by Talon Books out yeah, of Vancouver. Yeah, by uh, Sheila Fishman. She did the translation, and mm -hmm. Talon published. She won two uh, Governor's uh, Award uh, for the translations of my books. Speaking of books, Lemiac. Lemiac, yeah. The publishing house has published all your books. Yeah. In the, it will be 50 years next year. That's great. <laughs> That's loyalty. I'm faithful in life. I'm faithful in everything. I'd never heard about them until I'd read that you were with them. No, they're very important. It's a big, big place. So, uh, just in closing, can you tell me about the next uh, novel that's coming out? <laughs> We're coming back to, my, not my childhood, but to my souvenir, my, my memories. Uh, I was supposed to, uh, to go on um, uh, a sabbatical year. Last year I, didn't, I was tired, I just finished a nine-book saga, and I was called La, La, La Diaspora des Desrosiers, and I was tired. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friends and I, I, all my friends uh, used to say, uh, you'll write something, you'll write something. And I did. Um, in Key West, we were discussing one night uh, at table, uh, asking ourselves, what is your oldest memory? What some people don't remember anything for age five or age six, it's quite mm -hmm. amazing. They, they put a cross on their childhood. And I have one, I always had one that I never spoke about when I was like maybe a year, but maybe younger. And I decided just for fun the day after to write a, a three-page or four-page story about that. And I said, I must have other one, other memories that I never spoke about. So I wrote a, a book called uh, 23 uh, Well-Kept Secrets, okay. 23 Secrets Bien Gardés, uh, about 23 things that I never spoke about my, in my life, very funny things, very heavy things, uh, very weird things. 
uh, and I had so much fun all, all winter writing. Like, it's a very small book, like 100 page, I think, uh, not more. But it's very, uh, I, want, I almost said, to you, it's that cute, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Mm. <laughs> and it, it made me feel uh, good <laughs> writing it. And is it going to be translated into English? Oh, probably one day. Because she is very, very, very late. <laughs> <laughs> late? Yeah, because uh, the books are very long. They, they take oh, very she's long working time. through them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So she, now she's at uh, three or four of the nine books of La Diaspora de Diaosi. Okay. But there are other things after that. And, okay. <laughs> and so this one, again, will be published by... Uh, Le Miac Le Miac. and uh, Acte Sud in France. And uh, you'll be at the, will you be at the Salon de Livre in November? Yeah, I will, my 41. 41st? For the first one. Wow. And what are you going to be doing there? Well, signing books. <laughs> <laughs> and doing a reading, I gather. No, no I don't sign, not books. this year. They, no. Well, they didn't ask me yet, so. Okay. Well, if people want to come and meet you, get uh, your, their book signed and uh, talk about Quebec separation? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Thank you very much for your Thank time. you, it was very nice. I've been speaking to Michel Tremblay, who is Quebec's Balzac. Yeah. <laughs>